I did an episode with Anthony a while ago. We were talking about time management. I don't actually have the number of that episode written down right now, so deal with it. Uh, if you haven't watched that interview, definitely go and do that. This one will be more about the psychology behind how he runs his business, um, where before we talked about the psychology of how he manages his time. And so uh, this will be slightly different. Why don't you just real quick say what your business is and if you don't mind saying how much the business does each year? Yep, sure. So I have multiple businesses, but uh, for this, we'll focus on PCS. Um, initially founded the company in 2000. I was in college at Rowan University, East Coast, uh, Southern New Jersey, United States. And um, we started as a residential IT service provider, basically your door-to-door -door computer repair person, virus cleaner and all that. Uh, fast forward 22 years later, uh, we have 200 team members and uh, we work nationally and internationally helping businesses, nonprofits, government agencies uh, either run their day-to-day -day technology or recover from a ransomware attack from the hackers. So um, projected revenues this year are around 27, 28 million. Uh, last year closed around the 24, 25 million dollar mark. Nice, congrats. And I, I was mentioning before we started recording that you, I think last time we spoke, you had about 50 people less. Yeah, probably about 50 people less. And, and the crazy thing is over the last three weeks, we hired uh, an additional 13 team members. And that list is growing. Um, a lot of people have been talking about the job market and. It's definitely tougher for us, but for some reason over the past couple of weeks, um, it's been it's been floodgates for us with hiring people, which is great because uh, work is coming in like a flood. So we need the team. What made you excited about starting this business and what keeps you excited about this business? Funny, I could tell you what got me excited and what keeps me excited. And then I'll share a conversation from, from literally an hour ago. I said to my COO, this excites me. Um, what excited me the first time was you know, you look at all these big logos, right? You look at Geek Squad and you look at Dell and, you know, you always say, oh, that's so insurmountable, right? But then what happens is you actually see their work product. And the way that I started my business was a local repair company called The Bugget. I'm saying their name because they're out of business. They've been out of business for a long time. Charged my next door neighbor an exuberant amount of money back in, you know, 99, 2000. It was, they charged like 500 bucks. And guess what? they did not fix the problem. My neighbor called my parents literally and said, hey, we, we know your son's good at computers. Can he take a look? No training, no experience, no certification. I fixed that thing in like 15, 20 minutes. And what that meant to me was I could do this. I could go out there and make it happen. So the thing that excited me was I could make a lot more money than I was making, right? I was making 10 bucks an hour at the supermarket. My competitor was charging $120 an hour for me, 40 bucks an hour seemed great. So that's what I charged. So I was excited for me financially that I could do a lot better. I could make in one hour, four hours now. And secondly, I just, I just thought I could cut through a lot of red tape. I could cut through a lot of nonsense. And um, I think that's why this business model has been successful. Now, the thing that keeps me excited, uh, we have a lot of work coming in right now in uh, remediation and incident response. And what that basically is, is a company gets hacked and they're completely down. Well, getting, getting the team and pulling those pieces in place to figure out how's the best way we could deliver this service to our client with also not burning out our people. Um, so that stuff, you know, I guess it's, try, it's really trying to crack the code, right? Figuring out the puzzle. Um, I think that's something that's always going to excite me. Did you have any fears about starting the business? And do you have any fears... Do you have any fears that persist today? Yeah, every, every day, right? You worry about, you know, how you're going to perform, reputation, you know, as so, one of my clients going to get bought. So yeah, when, when I started the business, I think I had less fear than I did now, even, even with all the people that I do have. Right. So the interesting thing is I remember people saying, Hey, once you hit five years in business, you know, that fear is going to go away. You're going to feel so good Hit five years. And it was like, eh, still a little scared. Then they said, no, no, no. The real number is 10 years because you know, like 1% of businesses actually make it 10 years. I'm 22, 22 years in, and I'm still running fast. And I like to quote a great line from uh, Rocky Balboa. His kid asked him, he's like, hey, daddy, you know, are you scared? And, you know, obviously the Philly brawler and boxing champion in the movies. And he's like, oh, yeah, I always run a little faster when I'm scared. So I think, I think fear is a good motivator. Okay. Was there ever a time that you – 
have you ever regretted starting this business? No, I, I don't. I don't think there's ever been a regret. Um, I think there's, there's like every business owner goes through, right? There's moments of pain, there's moments of fear, and there's definitely moments of regret. Um, for instance, you know, six years ago, I bought my building that we reside in as our headquarters, and I have some tenants and, and things of that nature. And a year or so in the building, building ownership, I had a massive flood. Uh, there was a storm, the emergency drains, everything got filled up. I'm lucky the roof didn't collapse. It was basically a pool up there. And, you know, as I sat, as I sat in the, uh, the, the main entrance area and I'm just seeing drip, 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 like, what did I do? You know, and again, that was a moment of regret for an hour or two. And then it's like, okay, guess what? We got to get up. We got to fix this. We got a plan. What are we going to do? So I think every business owner has that moment. Um, but I think if you really enjoy what you do and you have a good team that far, far exceeds those expectations of any regret that you'd have. Have you ever thought about stopping this business at any time? No, I've a uh, hundred percent growth, 110% growth. Um, you know, we just added, uh, some, an office in Boston. Uh, we just had an office in Red Bank, New Jersey. So that's now our third office in New Jersey. Um, within, we started that office in October. We planned on starting that office, you know, two years ago, but apparently there was like some kind of virus internationally or something that slowed us down for a little bit. And, um, you know, we have four people in that office now. So for me, it's one mindset. It's, it's grow. It's either you're growing or you're dying and we don't want to die. What drives you on a daily basis? There's a few things that drive me and, it, and, you know, they, they change on a daily basis, yet they probably stay the same in some levels. So one, I absolutely love the people I work with. And, you know, one of the things um, you'll hear me say a lot is the longevity. I have so many people that I've worked with for over 10 years. I have a half dozen now, probably even more than a half dozen, probably closer to 10 that's been with me more than 15 years. So, you know, watching them grow, watching the company grow, being able to do more. I mean, that that's a definite motivator. Um, spreading our Kool-Aid across the country, you know, that's a motivator. Um, and then seeing what we've accomplished as a team, right? Um, probably three or four weeks ago, one of the biggest companies out there in, in, in the world and what we do, uh, definitely the gold standard of IT recovery forensics, uh, Kroll issued a press release with us jointly about how we're teaming up with them to tackle ransomware globally. You know, that's something special to be able to do that, to go, to go from a, a small bedroom in your parents' house to now help help fight the bad guys with one of the one of the best. So I mean all those things and you know it's almost like what Tom Brady would say, right? What, what's your favorite ring? And the answer is the next one, right? So why I'm excited about those accomplishments, what what drives me more is, you know, what's next? What are we going to do next? How are we going to how are we going to flip the script? How are we going to change the game? What has been the hardest decision you've had to make so far? Whew, that's a good question. Um a couple hard decisions. Um one definitely buying the building uh, didn't have the cash flow or really the um, really you know the 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 uh, reserves I should say but turned out to be a great decision to do that um, and then always um, you know even after all these years even letting letting go of team members that you know necessarily aren't pulling your weight so I guess my my worst decisions are the fact that I feel like I could fix people. Uh, there's times when, you know, someone's consistently not doing the right job. They're going to change. You're going to change. And, you know, we all think we're superheroes. So I think that's some of the, that's some of the worst decisions there that I've done. So kind of along that same line, how do you anticipate problems? And I don't just mean personnel problems. I mean, market shifts just in a, from a, a high level point of view, you know, no one has a crystal ball. I joke, I, I have one, but it's broken. Um, However, though, um, just really by being aware, right, there might be certain things going on in the world, whether it's in your industry, politically, environmentally, right? And you might agree, disagree, but what you have to do is remain neutral and understand reality, right? Reality is not always what you think it is or what you want it to be. Reality is what it is. So, you know, one of the conversations I've been having with our AR team is our accounts receivable are really good right now. People are paying. There's a recession coming down the line, right? You know, you already have the stock markets going down. We're at our worst start in 52 years. Something's coming down the pike. 
So you, you know, it's, it's almost like I'm a, I'm a big football fan and I love to play football I'm a little too old now getting beat up out there. But it, when you're quarterback and right, you have to have that sack clock, right? You know, some of it's art, some of it's science, but it's really, it's really just, you know, there's with social media and, you know, all the news feeds and everything else, you have to take time to read and you have to read all the perspectives, not just the ones that you agree with. It's a really interesting point. And I want to pull on that a little bit more. So are you concerned that your account receivables will get worse because of what's coming? So it's a real, it's a real new world for us here. Um, I'm concerned, but not as concerned as I would be. And the reason I say that is I was very concerned about our accounts receivable um, when COVID started. Well, something very surprising happened. And this was even before the PPP. People paid their bills more quickly. I almost feel like, at least for my particular business, we've shifted more to a utility where people now realize, oh, if I want to work from home, I need my IT company. So we've moved up the list. But does that mean we're guaranteed that we're going to get paid? No. So I just think, you know, there's certain clients that you have historically that are always slow pay. They're going to be slower. You just don't want to let yourself get put out there because at some point, you know, if, you're owed, if, if you owe me money, that's your problem. If you owe me a lot of money, that's my problem now. It's less your problem, which sounds kind of silly, but it is the truth. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, I went through that with my dad's dental business. He had like 120000 a month in outstanding because of the way that they were handling insurance claims. They were paper mailing everything. And it would take two months to get the money back. And when I realized what was happening, I convinced the team to move on to a digital program. And they were getting the money back in about seven to 10 days. And so the receivables went down to 40000 And they're like, holy crap, what do we do with all this money? So like, yeah, absolutely. So with that in mind, then, how do you discover potential bottlenecks in your business? And how do you handle them? So one of the things that's changed a lot from being a small business, you know, with, you know, 10 or 20 people um, going to where we're at now, you know, you know, I think every business owner, every CEO, you know, has done every job from, you know, the janitor to AR, AP, sales, marketing, and that gives you a feel, right? When the business is small, you could see those bottlenecks because every customer has direct access to you. Everyone's going to let you know what they're feeling. Um, now, the way that we find bottlenecks is, we have um, things that I was always opposed to meetings. You know, I always thought meetings were a waste of time. Um, you know, we have weekly meetings with different levels of leadership here. And, you know, we ask the good, the bad and the ugly. And when you start to see trends, right? You know, a lot of times as people, we tend to react, right? We, we'd rather respond, but we tend to react, which is just quickly. So now with these meetings and, you know, other checks that we have in place, um, the bottlenecks are, are more discoverable because you have a lot of people looking at them. So there's a lot of auditing, there's a lot of process review. And, you know, when things get jammed up, um, obviously it's a bottleneck. So, and I can tell you, you're always going to find bottlenecks. Uh, you fix one and then another one, another one occurs. So that brings me to a really interesting question, which is at the size you are now, what is your daily kind of routine? Like, what do you spend the most of your time on? And which of the team members do you spend the most time communicating with? And how has that changed from beginning until now? You know, the beginning, you know, I was out doing technical calls and in the office, out of the office sales. Um, you know, I was doing the books. Um, but now I probably communicate uh, realistically with about five to seven people on a daily, weekly basis. Uh, it's my chief operating officer, Tracy, uh, my director of IT, uh, Danny, and, um, I have a, a gentleman, well, two gentlemen, Jake and Mark, who run our other offices, along with another guy, uh, Chris, who runs our Red Bank office. Um, and then um, we have another person that runs our response team, Ryan, who I speak to quite a bit. You know, other than that, um, I don't have a lot of daily interaction. Uh, one thing that I do love to do, and I do this, you know, three, four times a day, I just walk the floor. I just walk around the building, say hi to everyone, see what's going on. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you could tell by the vibe, the tone, the looks on people's faces too, what's going on. So that also gives me a little intel to say, hey, you know, is that team getting overwhelmed? Um, or, hey, they're having a lot of fun. We're doing something right. That's good. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, I mean, but it is tough. You know, I joke just, just in our headquarters, we have about 120 some people, maybe 130. If you spend two minutes a day talking to everyone, 
that's over four hours. You know, you get nothing done. So my day to day really now is it's still sales. Um, I quote unquote say I'm a mascot for the company. Um, so definitely our strategic relationships, our partners, you know, I'm spending time with them out in the field. And, um, you know, I really do try to engage as much as I can with our clients. And that's why I have the mobile office, the tech tank. So while I'm driving from location to location, I could work. So it's very helpful. Have you ever thought about selling this business? No. You know, you get offers all day long. Who knows what's real, what's fake. But I mean, in our world, the offers come in, you know, literally 10, 15 times a week. Uh, some weeks. And, you know, I, I couldn't imagine putting all this time, all this energy, all this effort into making something great and stopping before that goal. Right. I think until we're the recognized leader, we didn't accomplish our goal. And realistically that will probably never happen because everyone says they're the biggest and the best. So, um, yeah, I just want to keep growing it. That brings me to something interesting. I, I normally ask people a little bit later on, which is, what is your concept of success? Now, uh, I've spoken to people where they have a, a number. Like when they're starting out, they go, I want to make a million dollars and then I'll be good. And then I have people that go, I want to have 200 employees, right? So ev everyone kind of has their own idea. So what was, did you have a number when you first started out? Or did you, like, what kind of a, a thing did you have that allowed you to know I have reached a level of success? And how has that changed? Does that number, is it, if it's a number, does that number keep changing? And kind of what is that number uh, and all that? Ed, that's a great question, right? So, you know, thank God I read a lot of Tony Robbins, a lot of other self-help and all this. So I've had a lot of numbers of success, right? Like I remember thinking, wow, when I hit $1 million in sales, there's going to be fireworks. So yeah, I made it. And what ended up happening was I was sitting at my desk on like a Friday night it was like six, seven o'clock at the office. Nobody was there but me. And I looked at QuickBooks and we were just over a million dollars. And it's like, oh, cool. Okay, I guess I'll go to the bar or something. You know, there wasn't that magic moment. Like I really expected that, you know, that was graduation level. You know, then I thought, you know, five million would be great. You know, that didn't seem achievable, right? You know, it took me, it took me three years to get to, you know, a million. Well, guess what? Two, two and a half years later, we're at five million. Eh, that wasn't good enough anymore. So let's do 10. Let's do 20. Um, employee count, you know, 50 was the Mecca. Like, oh, wow. Like if I get 50 people, then it went to 100, then it went to 200. And the reason why I alluded to Tony Robbins, one of the things that he put in his books about being happy is, and clearly I didn't listen to him, right? Um, he said, imagine if you're playing basketball, the net's there, you set the goal, you want to throw the basket in the basketball, or the basketball in the net. Well, you shoot it. It's a perfect shot. Well, then guess what? Someone takes a net and moves it back. That's what a lot of business owners and people do to themselves. And that that's honestly where I'm still at. So I don't, I don't really know the definition of success. Um, I'll define my next goal. I'll probably be happy you know, for a day or two after we hit it. And then it's going to be back to the drawing board. And you know, I think a lot of good entrepreneurs are like that. I don't, think, I don't think I'm unique in that sense because a lot of people I know that are very driven, you know, once they hit the goal, what's next, right? Grow or die. So I, I, I think that mentality, you know, really sticks with me. You know, one thing I would say, and I define success is when I get that note from the client that says, oh, your guys saved our business, or, you know, we're operating so much better thanks to you, or the note from the team member when they buy their new house or have their first child and how influential the company was in their life. You know, those are successes that stay, you know, you don't forget those. So I think for me, it's more that element right now with obviously, you know, a passion to grow. I mean, our next our next goal is 30 million. Yeah, I generally ask that question because I want the people that are going to be listening to understand, you know, where, where they are and where you are is very different. And so I want them to understand from people who are who have seen a level of success that they might aspire to, like that that kind of concept doesn't really change. It just kind of grows with you. And so, yeah, I guess so. One thing I would add to that though, and this is advice that I, I gave myself in my, in my thirties. Um, and this is for, you know, any, any entrepreneur, anyone growing, anyone looking to take that next step, right. Enjoy the ride. I did a, uh, I did an interview and I didn't realize I said this. Um, my friend had a magazine, put me on the front cover and it was about growth and, you know, doing great things in the community. And one of the quotes that I said was, 
I said, I wish I enjoyed the ride more. I wish I knew that everything would be okay. Looking back, I could have had a little bit more fun, um, especially in my 20s, because I took everything really seriously. And I still do. But, you know, just, I guess, time in the saddle experience. So the best advice to myself was knowing that if I did the right thing, work hard, I know everything's going to be okay. So that advice is definitely helping me now, you know, my early to early to mid thirties and now early forties. So it, it's definitely helped me uh, balance a little better. Yeah. I learned early on that when you get sick as I did, I mean, I can't really call it sick, but because of my concussion, it really messed up my health uh, for a while that like your health has to be more important than money. Like I, I learned that at 27 and I spend most of my time traveling. Like I, I may have mentioned by email before we arranged this, like I spent three weeks in Greece and then two weeks in Slovenia and then a month in Spain. And now I'm in Portugal and I'm, I'm moving to Portugal actually. So for me, like I would rather work less and earn less if it means I have more time to live my life the way I want, because so many people that I've met, a lot of them older, they have one single regret and that's that they didn't travel more. They didn't enjoy their life more. And I was like, well, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be old and unable to move and do these things and be like, oh, I wish I traveled more. Like I've been to 35 countries, mostly by myself. I've spent a majority of my adult life outside of America, living different things. I've, I've lived more than most people I've ever met. And if I were to die tomorrow, I would go, I had a pretty good life. And, and that's, that's what's important for me. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of traveling. You mentioned health too. I mean, you know, I look back the pictures when I was 36, 37, and you won't realize it. Like at least I didn't people that I talked to back at a couple of pictures, I was heavy. And one of the other big changes that I made was, you know, I make time for the gym. So I meet my trainer, you know, I'm at the gym, six 30 in the morning, three days a week. And then I go on Saturdays and just that, that, that energy you get and that feeling from, you know, being it being in better shape and that energy from working out and things like that, your health, if you don't have your health, if you feel like crap, your, your product's going to be crap. You know, your mind's going to drift. So yeah, don't, don't forget your health either. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember exactly when our interview was, but from February, 2021 until now I've lost 50 pounds. Oh, that's three, that's three big bowling balls you were carrying around. So that's amazing. Yeah. And I, I feel like I'm in my twenties again. Oh, your knees are saying, thank you. Absolutely. Y'all. I mean, I, I was at a point where when I wanted to put my shoes on and I was bending over, I couldn't breathe. It, it wasn't something that I would want anyone to ever experience. It was horrific. So, um, thankfully my divorce put me on the path to, uh, to taking better care of myself. But, um, so that what you just talked about gives me something interesting I want to ask about, which is, so you, you go to the gym, you're, you're trying to focus on your health. Clearly there are wins that are happening here in this process. So how do you celebrate a win? And have you ever experienced kind of falling off the wagon on this journey of your health or, or growth of the company that would al allow you to experience losses and kind of how do you celebrate wins and handle losses? Obviously the, the losses hurt a lot more than the wins. <laughs> Uh, for some reason, you know, the, the sting and the, the, the pain of losing um, lasts a lot longer. The win, it's like, yes, you got it. You get the dopamine and that's over. Um, but, you know, little simple ways, right? You know, you have, you have a nice win. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's an extra happy hour, right? Maybe it's, you know, I'm just going to go at five o'clock somewhere by myself for an hour and a half. And remember, I'm not condoning drinking and driving. I have the tech tank. Someone drives it for me. So I'm not driving. Um, but yeah, just, you know, sometimes a little happy hour by yourself, you know, sometimes as silly as it sounds, right. You know, with two kids and everything else, you don't get a lot of free time. Hey, hon, listen, I'm gonna go downstairs and just veg out and play a video game, you know, stuff that you used to do all the time, but you know, you just can't when there's other responsibilities. Uh, losses on the other hand leads to a lot of pen and paper, a lot of phone calls. If other people were involved, text messaging, uh, phone calls, video chats, you know, figuring out accepting the loss right the most important thing you have to do is accept the loss if you lose you can't blame anyone or it's because of this or because of that because guess what someone else did something that you didn't do but really trying to dissect that loss um and you know and that's part of i think the stinging process um so that's how i handle losses just why did it happen what caused it 
what areas were under my control, right? So for instance, if we, if we lose a big job, that's maybe a ransomware remediation because all the flights got canceled, right? Yeah, I'm pissed off, but is there anything else could I have done? Could I have chartered a private plane? Would that have made sense? So, you know, dissecting everything to see, and maybe the answer is no, you couldn't. So it's like, okay, well, we did the best we could. It sucks. We lost. The other way is, oh, well, did you not book the flight early enough? Did you not check the other airline? So it's, it's, figure, it's figuring out why. Um, one of the things I say to all our team members here, if they screw up, I don't care how big it is, right? Uh, as long as they're not violating any laws, you know, the first time something goes wrong, it's called a learning experience here. Now, if you do the same thing again, then you're an idiot. I can't help you, right? You got to learn from your mistake. So at what revenue... Fr- um range do you start to consider buying a private jet in order to move your people around god i don't that that's a great question i don't even know because i couldn't imagine what those things cost i mean every once in a while if you flip around on those apps and things like that just a um just a flight from you know jersey to like florida is like 10 to 12 grand a pop um so i couldn't even i think you'd have to get to at least 100 million and it also depends on what kind of revenue because our revenue gets skewed sometimes because, you know, there's labor revenue and then there's hardware revenue. Well, I could, I could move 200 grand in hardware and maybe make $3,000. So, you know, I could, I could pound my chest and like, oh yeah, we did $200,000 in sales. But at the end of the day, I just made my number bigger. You know, I, I score some points with Dell and I get some credit card points but it's not necessarily a revenue producer. It's more of a, it's more of a chest flex. Yeah. I actually interviewed a guy um, who runs a group of companies and he's from the country of Georgia and they're all in aviation and he has a, an app. So he has several private pl- uh, planes that he charters, but he also has um, a team that helps him to fill the demand and they mostly work around Europe, but he also has been developing an app that will allow them to kind of, uh, automate this process by making it so that the team doesn't have to do those calls and all that. I think they they did like four million in the in revenue in the first like year or something, just like filling planes. Um, so yeah, we we did the whole interview about how society is changing. Well, again, we mostly focused on Europe because that's his market, but we, we were talking about how uh, more people are making more in the millions and how they can afford these flights and. He gave an example of like, oh, let's say you're uh, living in Barcelona and there's an opera in in Paris that you want to attend. You just, you know, call us, you hop on a plane, you're there in an hour and a half. You don't have to go through customs or anything like that. And you're just in and out. You go for the opera and you come back and, you know, maybe you spend seven grand for like the flights. But like you just you go on a date or you meet a friend or whatever. And I was like, I don't think like that. It's like it was hard for me to imagine. It's like, yeah, I'm just taking I'm taking the bus down the street, you know. Yeah, well, Europe is it's very different like I mean, you could take a, a a flight and it's like an hour between, you know, like Madrid and London. Like it's just so easy to move around different countries. So it's a different concept for them for sure. So, obviously you've been through a lot in running this company. I'm curious how have you had to change yourself in order to stay relevant? Wow, that's a that's another good one. Um, you know, it's I've definitely I've definitely evolved more than probably most because if you really think about it, I was I was a college kid when I started this thing. Um, my COO at the time, she was a client. Um, I used to her, her kids were younger. I went to their house, and the first time I had so much energy and I was just so like all over the place, like. She actually thought I was on drugs because, like, who who is this guy? Like, you know, blurted out whatever I wanted. You know, I just I was crazy, and I was like, you know, I, this interview I'd be like scratching my head and going just like everything was. So I really I had to evolve um, from a technician to somewhat of a businessman slash leader, then to a real leader, and then to really grow the business. Really I had to turn into a marketer and a TV personality and. You know, everyone thought I was a joke in like 2006 or 2007. I used to tell people that, you know, I was going to make IT Hollywood. I was going to make IT sexy, right? Everyone thinks all these IT guys are a bunch of geeks and all this. Like, I'm going to make IT fun. And I think by going out there, I mean, one of our differentiators as a business, and, you know, companies are catching on now, but it's too late because we're already moving on, is 
all the stuff I did at like the local chambers and things like that, everyone knew who I was. And because I made friends first, when then people had a problem because I was out there every day, um, I was, and I still am probably the most approachable CEO at the level we are. I'm still going out three, four nights a week. So, you know, I'm a pretty easy man to find. And, you know, I think that gives people comfort if they're working with us because it's like, okay, I, I could go talk to Anthony on Tuesday night at this event, Wednesday night at this event. Oh, he's going to be at this golf outing they sponsored. So I think people feel more comfortable doing business with us uh, because of that evolution, right? And look, the other thing is too, we've been here so long, right? You know, I've been doing this business for over half my life. So I think that gives folks that work with us a feeling of stability. We're not going anywhere. So I think it's all those things, but you know, the de definitely the evolution from the IT geek to more of a TV personality and business leader and all those little micro steps on the way. Uh, definitely, definitely getting out of the field. 100% not being a tech, you know, and, you know, and then, and then look, you know, inside the office, right. You know, like well, some of our accounting functions, I thought nobody could do them better than me. Right. And finally I started to step back and give them to other people and yeah, they couldn't do it better than me. They can do it way better than me. Um, so I think, I think as a business owner in some ways, and this isn't a bad thing because you should have pride. It's, it's also that narcissism, right? You just, no one's better than me at this because I built this and, I think part of being able to let that go is an evolutionary process because then you could wor worry about getting good at other things, you know, getting good at process, getting good at business development. Um, and that's going to be different for everyone. You know, it's finding your superpower. And, um, but, you know, a, a superpower is definitely delegating tasks that you just don't need to do. I think I learned really early on that my superpower was being a generalist where I can basically learn anything I need and I can build something from that very quickly, but it breaks very fast. And that's when I need to hire someone to come and like make it something sustainable. Um, so it's good for me because I, I'm a self-starter. I'm a self-learner. I can get there fast, but it also breaks fast, which is good because it forces me to go, okay, well, this is the best I can do in a short amount of time. Now I have a basic understanding of what I need someone else to do. Now I can just hire them to go and do it. And I think that's a great skill set. I mean, one of the things that really helps me with PCS and understanding the business here, which I don't necessarily have with the other companies I invested in, I could truly say I've done every job here at PCS, whether it's been for six months, a month, a week, um, where at least I have some level of understanding. You know, I invested in a software development company and, you know, I'm really great at helping to connect the dots with them in the community and knowing when our client has a need for that software. But when it comes to delivery, the business model, I don't know anything about that because I have written, I wrote, you know, <laughs> maybe a hundred lines of code in college in my C plus plus class. You know, that was that was really it. I don't understand development styles or or even what it takes. You know, I'm more like an end user. Oh, just put the button there. It's just a button, right? Not ten thousand lines of code behind that button. Um so I just can't help as much. I think I think your side of being a generalist is really, really good. I was tech tech inclined, but I never really cared for it. Like I was involved in the hardware and networking in high school. I had a, a high school of 1,400 computers. And my brother was involved in a, a special elite like networking group that like was only for juniors and seniors in high school. So like, you had to go through some of the coding classes and get to know the coding teacher who also ran the networking group because like he was responsible for managing all these computers and he couldn't do it all himself. So he got students to do it for him for free and he got experience. So my brother like convinced the teacher that I had experience. Like my brother had taught me virtual basic. So he got me out of the VB class and into a C++ class. I had never done VB. I'd never done C++. I basically copied all of the C++ code from like my neighbors and I convinced him of my personality. So he put me into the networking club. And so I got to spend my junior and senior years, the first hour and a half of, of my day going around fixing the computers. And I could do that. I could, you know, um, we had go like we would ghost the computers. And so I, I was ghosting all that. We upgraded the computers like once, like the whole school got brand new computers. Like I have a lot of that experience, but I never liked to code. So I've always like, had a love hate relationship with tech. I understand it, but I choose to kind of keep it at arm's length in a way. Um, and I've always kind of preferred the people side and the psychology of how things happen and why they happen. And, and I think that's 
that curiosity has allowed me to learn the skill of learning, which made me, which allowed me to become a generalist. Computers are one thing for the most part, unless it ships fried, they're logical, right? So typically if you follow a process, it's going to work. So working on networks, working on computers, I think gives you good troubleshooting steps. Ironically enough, though, when you said ghosting, one of the funniest things, uh, we just moved into this office, so it had to be nine years ago. Uh, one of our technicians, we, you know, we do best contests for Halloween. He, um, he blew up a box of Norton ghost and basically cut his arms out through it and put his head. So he was dressed as a ghost. I so I thought that was pretty witty. So you brought back a good memory there. I seem to bring out memories. I was with a, a guy last night. I, I met who like, I, he used to go to a bakery in, in Portugal with his grandmother after school and they would eat the, this like specific kind of a treat. It's like this coconut uh pyramid that's like turned yellow and i told him yesterday like oh i went to this cafe and like i had this thing and he was like oh my god like i used to eat those every day with my grandma like i haven't had them in years like i, I through as i'm traveling i and talking with people i just seem to bring up memories from people in a good way but you get a lot of experience with all the travel i mean that's like you said earlier you live you lived a couple lives so that's pretty cool yeah so you you've kind of touched on how you've changed yourself. I'm curious, what's the most important change you've had to make in the business so that it remains relevant? The most important change that I made to the business was pulling myself out of a lot of operational roles. Um, you know, again, that delegation, that trusting people, um, there's definitely tweaks along the way. Um, you know, 12 years ago, we switched our software system to something more robust that if we didn't have that, the business probably, I don't say would have failed, but it would have really struggled. Um, but I think the biggest part of the business was separating Anthony Mangialuzzo from PCS. While that separation will never be full, uh, because I'll always identify with the business and things of that nature. Um, I guess the biggest change was kind of, you know, handing the baby over to someone else and saying, Hey, you could have a turn. And, um, you know, a lot of our best ideas and our best innovations came from in-house. So. I think that's the biggest and best change, you know, just letting myself get out of the way. Yeah, that's important. I, I like to ask that question as well, because I want people to understand. I, I talk to a lot of people that have just started a business. They're maybe doing five, 10,000 a month. They're hitting that point where they could probably go a little bit more before they hit a ceiling in their own ability and time where I'm trying to convince them you need to start building a team or else you're never going to grow past this. I'm like, do you want to be a freelancer or do you want to be a business owner? And so I asked that question because it's really important for people to understand, like, get out of your own head, get out of your own ass, hire people. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, fortunately, I had, I had an insane work ethic or I would have probably hit that ceiling. Like, I could just go and go and go. Um, but, you know, now having a family, two daughters, things like that, I don't think I don't think I could have done what I did. You know, if I didn't, if I didn't really, you know, have children a little bit later, you know, I didn't, I didn't have my first toes, so basically almost 35 years old. Um, and my life would have been completely different because I wouldn't have been able to take those risks and do those different things. But I'm sure I definitely created ceilings at some point where you don't even know it, right? I'm sure there's things that I missed out on and opportunities or ideas. And, you know, you can't look back and worry about it now, but you just have to realize the fact that, you know, other people can contribute a lot and, and do a lot in many ways, a lot better than you. So, you know, that's, that's the biggest thing I think, you know, like you said, just avoid, avoid that ceiling. We all, we all have a plateau. We all max out at some point. How does having kids change your business or change you in terms of how you do business? Like before it was like, you know, okay, if I work 14 hours, my wife's home, she'll be fine. She'll see me. We talk, you know, everything's good. We got the weekend. Um, but with kids, you realize a couple things. Um, one, now that time becomes ultra valuable because they're only going to be kids once, right? You're not going to get the chance to experience two again or three or four or five. The second thing is they need you. They want you in their lives. So for me, the biggest thing was how do I balance my life and still work the same amount of hours while also still being, you know, a family man. So for me, I'm a bit lucky in a sense where my daughters, they go to bed at seven o'clock at night during the school year. They wake up at 7 a.m. Right now, summertime, they're out of school. They go to bed at 7 p.m. and they get up at 8 a.m. So what I'll do is 
uh, if I'm working late or doing different things, you know, I'll instead of having a dinner at 6.30, I might tell a business associate, hey, I'll meet you at 8.30. I'm like, yeah, why so late? Well, I'm gonna go talk to my kids. So go home, do the dinner thing with them. So I'm still working the same amount of hours and having the same amount of productivity, but I'm shifting on how I do things. So also, if I know that, you know, I'm gonna have a late night where I'm not gonna tuck them in, guess what? Maybe I'll start at 9.30 because I'm gonna have breakfast with them and, you know, wake them up in the morning. Um, so it's really just more making that time and understanding what time is the most important, and that is your family time. And again, that also leads to delegation and other things, because maybe there's some tasks that you know were once a, a high priority on my list, maybe are a little bit lower. So now I could then say, okay, well, how can I get this, this, and this off my plate to free up that time? You know, what that does is two things: one, that lightens my load. But two, it gives someone else else a chance to elevate, which is also great. For sure, it makes sense. I I can't imagine having a kid. Like I was, uh, I was talking to a friend. He ha- just had a second kid. I'm like, I struggle to take care of myself with all of the time. Like, I don't know how the hell you can take care of a wife and two girls, two little kids. Like, I couldn't. You you won't be hitting 35 countries. I can tell you that. <laughs> Be a five. <laughs> I would like to meet someone that I could take with me wherever I go, but hopefully they have their own career. So they're not like relying on me. You know, I would just think if you're traveling so much, like schooling with the kids and things like that would probably, you know, definitely be a consideration. Well, I think at some point you have to settle down a little bit. What is your first thought in the day? First thought in the day. Hmm. You know, what gets you out of bed in the morning, I guess, or maybe they're two different questions. I guess they are kind of two different questions because probably my first thought of the day starts with my last thought of the night, right? You know, before I go to bed, you know, I make a task list. I look at my calendar and say, okay, you know, what do I have to get done? So typically my first thought of the day is personal, to be honest, um, because I'm working out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then Tuesday and Thursday, the first thing I do is get a medical massage. So typically other than, you know, looking at your emails and doing the stuff while you're eating breakfast, um, really the first thought is, okay, you know, w- what's today? Leg day, aren't, what are we going to do? Um, while that workout's going on, I have a trainer, a lot of times I'm, I'm then able to formulate, okay, well, what's act, what's going on now? Because me, I'm, I'm not the best morning person. Like I'm probably one of the most friendly morning people, but the brain's kind of like half turned on. Um, so it takes me a little bit to get going there. So I think that's why it's good for me to have the gym and, you know, the other stuff, because then by the time that's all done, man, I'm, I'm juiced up and ready to go. And, you know, typically, again, my if, if you say my first business thought, it's always about growth every day. I, I asked Danny, our director, hey, who do we hire? What are we doing? Our ad's up. What's going on? So it's always that, you know, what's next mentality. When do you decide to tackle the hardest thing? Yeah, so I always, I always try to tackle the hardest thing first. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, emergencies or everything else in every business. Um, sometimes that's a little tough in IT. Um, because if you have people at your door, other things going on. So I'd like to think that I tackle the most important thing first and then the hardest thing. Sometimes it's one and the same. Uh, not always, but, um, you know, you definitely have to have some flexibility in what you're doing. Um, because if you're too rigid, I think you can mess things up. How do you handle distractions? So like, for example, I've got 10 different chat apps. And I hate looking at them, but like, I've got people messaging me. Sometimes it's for work. Sometimes it's personal. How do you handle that? I'm pretty bad, right? So I'm not diagnosed, but I always said that I have ADD. You know, my distraction is more my phone between the text messages and the emails coming in all day. Um, Essentially what I do is, you know, I'll just focus on whatever I need to for a specific period of time. So for instance, you know, right now I probably have a hundred emails in my inbox. When this podcast is done, I am not getting up from my desk unless there's an absolute fire until everything urgent is answered and I have less than 25 emails. So I basically, I try to, I just try to take bites out of different things at certain times. So it's like, okay, well, I got through these emails. Okay, well, now I got six text messages. Let's go through those. So I really just try to focus on one thing at a time as I'm hopping through. Now, granted, that being said, as soon as this is over, someone could be at my door and say, hey, you know, this international company got hit by a virus and, you know, you were getting a call to fix them. Well, guess what? We're going to handle that. (laughs) So it's really, and part of it is, part of it's also skimming, right? You know, if you go through your emails, you could say, okay, well, you know, there's probably five or six of these that have the potential to be important. 
let me look at those. I'll worry about the other stuff later. So it's also finding your own groove. You just gave me an idea for a business. Uh, well, I assume a lot of people, uh, you have an, an executive assistant. Wouldn't it be great if they could skim through those emails and mark them, which ones are the most urgent. And like, there's a tag that's like, this is urgent. This is less urgent. I wish. So there's some smart mail programs. Um, I hear the new outlook, um, which I haven't used yet, uh, does a great job at that. The problem for me is. You know, even though I probably have like 12 different LLCs and eight different email addresses, realistically, 99% of my email comes through my PCS email. There's a lot of confidential things that go through there that either I'm under NDA or maybe it's just some stuff from personal nature. You know, my wife and I communicate via that email, so I won't be comfortable opening that up. But I think that's a great idea. For instance, if you, it's almost like carrying two cell phones, right? If I had like my private Anthony PCS account where all that confidential stuff goes. And then I had just my generalist that would definitely work. And, you know, I know a lot of my friends have their assistants do that for them. And, you know, for me, I just have too much other stuff where I would, you know, violate other people's trust or literally legal agreements where I couldn't. So who do you look up to for advice? God, a lot of different people. So, you know, what I try to, what I try to do is, you know, people look at people rate people based on their job title or how much money they make and all that. And I think that's all BS, right? So what I, I look to so many different people for advice, depending on what they're experts in. So for instance, you know, my attorney, obviously he's my mecca for anything legal or anything that I want to do there. Um, my trainer, right. I'm always asking him advice. You know, we work out together four days a week. So one of the things I'm blessed with, and this is this is one of the things that I sought out over time, you know, I want to know that someone who's the best at everything, right? And when I say everything, one person's good at this and that, because then I'll have this big pool of people that I could talk to. And guess what? Sometimes it's the most uneducated person on the planet that just has a ton of life experience. So I don't really care about degrees. I don't really care about certification. I really care about the results that people produce in the areas that they focus on. So definitely have a lot of different mentors. So outside of those people, what are your favorite resources for learning? Books. You know, I do a lot of reading, um, you know, a lot of self-help books. Um, I listen to a lot of Audible. Um, and, you know, I, I go through a lot of different coaching, right? You know, even personally, right? I have my gym coach. I have my piano coach, um, a stretching coach. So just a lot of different things. So, you know, I'm looking at a lot of different sources. I'm not, I'm not a big YouTuber uh, in terms of looking at like online videos for help. Um, although that does help me with some small tasks if I'm, you know, have a little hobby or trying to do something. Uh, but I would say, I would say reading is probably my number one go-to. So then what are you currently learning? Um, so I'm reading this book. Um, guy's uh, name is uh, Tim Groover. He's, um, he was Michael Jordan's coach and Kobe Bryant's coach. And, um, his book is called winning and it's understanding the psychology of winning and the way that he wrote this book, it defined winning and competition, like exactly how I thought about it in my brain, but could never verbally express it. So I learned a lot about that type of psychology. Um, the other thing I've been actually doing a lot more advanced uh, business balance sheets, and I'm trying to learn more about real estate when it comes to, um, you know, NOI and cap rates and things like that, um, because real estate just fascinates me. So I'm talking to some folks trying to trying to learn, you know, the different cap rates for the different types of uh, properties, whether it's apartment complexes, manufacturing, and uh, different techniques there. I think that's, I think that's a real good lifelong skill. And then the other skill that I'll, I'll say learning, I don't know how good I'm doing is uh, golfing. That's a, uh, that's a frustrating game. I would normally want to ask about the real estate, but I know that that's a conversation on its own. Uh, as for golf, I will say I quite like it. I never thought I would. And I got introduced to it in China. Oh, wow. Yeah, of all places. I got introduced to it through COVID, so it's the only way to meet people. <laughs> so I, I started learning about it maybe eight, nine years ago. And I only did it a few times. The only reason I stopped was because like I had a friend who knew a coach at a private place and it was like 
I don't know, thousand dollars a year to be a member. And at the time I was broke still. And so I was like, I can't afford this. So I got a few lessons for free. And then I was like, okay, well, um, but it turned out I was, I was decent at it. And then I moved to Vietnam and I had an Australian friend. I have an Australian friend and he had a set of clubs. And so he would be like, Hey, let's go to the driving range. It's like, you know, a mile from where we were living. And it was only like $10 to hit a hundred balls. I was like, all right, fair enough. So we'd, we'd go once a week and we'd play. And like very quickly, he taught me how to go from like 50 yards to 180 yards on average with a driver. Oh, that's great. And it's been a while, obviously, because I don't know of any golf ranges in Portugal or anywhere else in Europe. I have to look for them. But um, even in America, there was a driving range like right next to my parents' house. So I'd go there once in a while. But yeah, I, I've never actually played 18 holes. Like I've done mini golf, but I've never done 18 holes. Yep. Like, And so it's very, very different. But on the driving side, I quite enjoy it. It's very peaceful. Just like whacking a ball as hard as you can. You know, my, my biggest thing is I just got to get lessons again. I took lessons a little while ago. It lapsed. You know, COVID quote unquote ended. Things got real busy. Um, but I just got a name sent to me actually yesterday. So I'll be reaching out to try to schedule. And that, again, that'll be one of those things you know, hopefully I could meet the um, individual. The, the country club for me is five minutes from my house. So I could tuck my kids in at seven and be there by, you know, 7.30 comfortably. So maybe, you know, in the summertime, at least when it's nice out still, 7.30 to 8.30. And, you know, hopefully hopefully after a couple months, you know, at least be uh, respectable. You know, I'm respectable for about four, four or five holes out of 18. And then it would go downhill from there. Fair enough. Uh, now, you were also talking about playing video games. I just wanted to kind of mention to you, I don't know if you have a Meta Quest 2, any sort of like VR device. HTC Vive. Okay. Well, so there's a game called Walkabout. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's like a mini golf VR, which is like really top quality. I've never played a better VR game. Um, but there's other ones like Golf Plus. Again, I'm not sure if they're on the Vive. But I imagine they are. Like those are more real uh, golf. Yeah, I have a great mini golf course. Um, it's called like Vi It's Pinelands VR or something on the Vive. And um, Jake, who runs uh, Delaware for us, he has the Vive as well. And uh, we could actually play mini golf together. Um, and the experience is real. It's very realistic. I mean, all this VR stuff, to me, it's almost a little too realistic. Um, I remember the first time I got a boxing game and, you know, one of the guys is like punching at me. I had to take off my headset. I'm like, it's just it's too real. This guy's like beat me up. So the roller coasters are good too on VR. I can't. Those make me nauseous. The other games don't, but yeah, that one bothers me. My friend was at my house just sitting on the floor with the headset on and you could start to see the sweat coming. I'm like, Drew, Drew, just take it off. You're good. You're good. Just take it off. So I'm curious, what's the most important thing you've learned in your life? Defeat is only temporary, right? You never lose the battle until you quit. So I see so many people that quit, they get frustrated and just say, I'm done. And they throw their hands in the air. Um, you know, really just never quit is probably the most important life lesson because you know as long as you're in the game there's a shot to win well i appreciate your time and your energy and and being open and vulnerable about everything and i'm sure i could have gotten much deeper in some ways but uh yeah i, I feel satisfied with what we talked about cool no, this was this was fun i appreciate it